from the St. Francis Yacht Club in San Francisco. This is the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, hosted by Ron Young. Welcome to another of our Wednesday Yachting Luncheons. It's fun to be in our new home over here in the Northwest Golden Gate Room. Um, it's beautiful weather outside, but it's just warmer inside our clubhouse. Um, so many of us grow up watching television and listening to all these amazing scientists, and lots of people think they're far away from us and they're aloof, and after all, what do they have to do with us human beings? Uh, our speaker today um, is quite an exception to that, though he has an incredibly impressive background. He's actually interested in how we got here and how we got to be who we are. So starting in New York, he was first acquainted with anything to do with the water when he took the, guess what, Staten Island Ferry back and forth to Manhattan with his folks. All through high school, he was seen as a science nerd and an ultimate Frisbee player. He went off to Princeton, that's not a bad place to start your academic life, got himself a BA in physics, and then went on to Cornell where he got a master's degree and ultimately a PhD in physics. He went then to do postdoc work at IBM, also not a, not a really unimpressive place to start your, your work world, um, and then would go on to become a professor of physics at our own local UC Berkeley. As he studied physics and got more and more into it year after year after year, he began to do something interesting. His topic began to evolve. His interest began to change from physics to biology. And of course, he never stopped thinking about the links between the two. He's basically interested in understanding how humans, how we evolved from what? That is to say, from the first forms of life, which certainly came from the sea, hence the connection to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, and to where we are today. So um, as he basically went through this whole evolutionary process, he went to work and was recruited to work on none other than the Human Genome Project. So please welcome our own uh, incredibly interesting, fun science nerd, Dan Rokshire. Come on up, Dan. Thanks, Ron. I think, I think Gilligan's Island may have predated my rides on the ferry. I'm not 100% sure. So, uh, so thanks for having me and for braving the weather. I'm going to talk to you about something that you might not think about, which is how are animals related to each other, and what does that tell us about the process of evolution? So what I want to do, I have a couple of things I want to accomplish. One is to sort of acquaint you with deep time and thinking about evolution over long periods of, of, uh, of time. And then to, am I closer? I should be closer to it. Okay, is that better? Okay, thanks. Um, thinking about genetics, which a lot of people are sort of, you know, have some vague familiarity with, I'm gonna try to introduce you briefly to what a genome is and why we use it. And then I want to give you three short stories, maybe we'll only get to two, um, about what were the first animals like, that is the ancestors of all living animals that are alive today. Thinking about unusual animals like sea stars, which unlike us, where we have a body axis, they have this five-fold axis. How did, how did that arise? And can we understand how that happened maybe 500 million years ago? And then I'll give you a little bit of a glimpse about how I think our kind of animals, vertebrates, evolved from invertebrates. So it's a, it's a lot to do, but I think I can give you with pictures uh, some, some, uh, some summary. So unfortunately, on the main screen, my slides are a little bit off the, off the edge, but on the side screens, it, it, it fits. So this is a, a cartoon of the deep time. So what's shown here on the on the right is time in millions of years, and it goes down to about 542 at the base of the Cambrian, so that blue layer there. And then below that, everything gets compressed, and then we talk about 2.5 billion and 4.6 billion. We were talking about this earlier with Fritz. That's the, the earliest time of the formation of the Earth. And so during this time, above about 542 million years, you find a lot of fossils, 
and those are shown on the left side of the diagram, cartoons of the kinds of fossils you find. And initially, you find a lot of trilobites and a lot of weird other kinds of uh, vaguely insect or, or bug-like creatures. And it's only much later that you find our kind of animals, vertebrates, that are represented as fishes and then dinosaurs and, and so on. And we have some idea of how evolution works by looking at this fossil record. That gives us some kind of a glimpse, although to make it into the fossil record, you have to mostly have hard parts, you have to be buried in just the right way for your body to turn into a, a fossil. So it's only a partial, a partial kind of view. But we're talking about the span of life is at least 500, maybe 600 million years, which is an uh, absurd amount of time to think about. During that time, I, I put this up here because I thought you guys might be interested in this. During that time, the Earth as we, as we visualize it on our globes has changed dramatically. And so this is a, a series of snapshots. In the upper left, it's 390 million years. And in the lower right, it's almost at that Cambrian explosion time, 514 million years. And these are all views where the equator is in the middle, the sort of standard view. And you can see that the continents are all rearranged. In fact, many of the continents that we recognize today don't exist as individual units. They're jammed together, and they have yet to separate, or they have yet to arise from, from under the Earth. Right. So everything is very dynamic, although it's happening over millions of years. So it's dynamic, but it's very, very slow. If I think about animal diversity, then I have to think about Darwin. Darwin is the one who helped us understand how, that, how to think about that. And so when I have here a picture of a sampling of different mammals, right? So these are all animals in the same general um, class as we are. And you can see that they're very diverse. So right in the middle, held in the hand, those are baby hedgehogs, which I think are among the cutest animals alive. And they're very small, obviously they fit in a hand. Next to it is whales, right? And then we have, we have us on the, on the right, uh, the Commodore, I guess. Um, and then on the, on the left, we have elephants and aardvarks. And there's a lot of other creatures in between. And Darwin said in his, in his great work, he wrote one picture, he said, I think, and then he drew a tree. We can take this information and we can organize it so that organisms that are more closely related to each other are neighboring, neighbors on the tree. So bats and hedgehogs in this group are more closely related. They form a, an earlier branch. And then the most distant relatives are us and bunnies on the, on the right, and elephants and aardvarks. They have an ancestor down at the bottom where there's that green circle. That's the organism or the group of organisms, the, the, the species, that was the common ancestor of all living mammals today. Right? So one of the things that happens when you look back in time is everything kind of funnels back to these common ancestors. And so thinking about how, how evolution works, you're drawn to thinking about those ancestors. And that individual, those, that species lived 500, maybe 100 million years ago. Okay. But all of these, and you can see that within this 100 million year time range, a lot of different lifestyles have evolved, right? You have bats that fly, you have whales that swim, right? You have all these different kinds of ways of, of living. So 100 million years, while it seems like a long time, it, it is a long time in that it has allowed a lot of things to, to diversify. And so as we look further and further back in time, we're going to be looking at more and more diverse animals. There's a kind of a, a, a logic to thinking about this that I think is, is accessible to everyone. If I look at, say, a skeleton, and I look at our upper arm, right, we know that we have a humerus, a radius, and an ulna, wrist bones. We have an elbow joint. We have all of these kinds of structures. And if I look at all of the mammals that I just showed you, they have that kind of structure that you can recognize. So here I have a picture of a human arm and a bat arm. And you can see that there's always that upper bone that's connected to the shoulder. In bats, it's really small. In humans, it's relatively large. But it articulates then at an elbow and so on and so forth. So as long as I can recognize how the different bones correspond to each other, I can start to think about how evolution might have acted to stretch or compress these these elements retaining their same connectivity. Right? And so that implies then that the common ancestor of bats and humans almost certainly had that kind of organization. Right? That would be the natural uh, 
the natural conclusion. The alternative would be that somehow independently this was you know, convergently evolved. The ancestor didn't have that, and bats decided to have this structure, and humans decided to have the structure independently. And we can test that idea by then looking at other animals and at fossils. And so if we look at birds and dinosaurs, I see that they also have that structure. And in fact, it goes even farther back in time. It goes back, you know, amphibians have it as well, right? And I can even start to think about how that might have emerged from in, in fish, which don't have limbs at all. So I can figure out by comparing human and bat or any kind of pair that I want, I can do this kind of triangulation back to some ancestral node. And the more divergent I look, the deeper back in time I go. So here's a broader picture uh, that shows all kinds of jawed vertebrates. So animals like us that are vertebrates plus they have jaws. There are some vertebrates that don't have jaws like hagfish and lamprey that I'll talk about maybe later. And so this is their relationship. And over this time period, now we're talking about 460 million years. So an appreciable fraction of the history of animals is, in, is encompassed here. You can see that with these red dashes, these are the, the points in time at which a particular structure or a particular feature was invented by evolution. It, had, it arose in evolution through at that, at that time. And so if I look at amphibians, primates, rodents and rabbits, crocodiles, and birds, they all have four limbs, so their ancestor had four limbs. And I can look in the fossil record for those kinds of creatures at the times that I predict, and we can find those. Right? That's one of, the, one of the great discoveries of the last decade or so, was the discovery of earliest four-limbed animals at exactly the place and time that you would have predicted it. And then we can go back further and further back in time. And that's great. That's really interesting. But I have a lot of fossils here. This is a very well-studied area, and we know a lot about it. But I'm really interested in origins. I want to know where things came from at the beginning. And so to do that, I have to encompass all of animals. And of course, I don't have to stop at animals. I could do animals and plants. I could keep going. But I'm going to con confine myself to animals here. This is a tree of the major living animal groups, and it's kind of overwhelming. Um, each of the different uh, branches of the tree are a different distinct kind of animal. So at the far left there you see arthropods. That one branch includes all bugs, all insects, crabs and lobsters. Uh, all, that whole group is included in that one branch. So each of these represents still an enormous amount of diversity. Thanks. Yeah, perfect. Thanks. And then over here, this vertebrates, that's what I just, just showed you, right? That's all of the, the vertebrates. And then all of these other animals are different groups. So mollusks, there's tens of thousands of species of mollusks. Clams, octopus, uh, snails, they all encompass here. So this is an enormous amount of diversity. And you could say, well, let me do that same process. What is it that all of these share that would allow me to understand something about their ancestor? Right, so by this branching tree, there was an ancestor of all of these living animals. What is it that they share that I could then say must have been already present and invented at that point? And it's hard to do, right? I mean, I have to compare, let's say, the human body plan to the body plan of an octopus, right? How do I do that? And you can think about that, and we, we, we can talk about how, how you approach that, that problem. But one of the things that all of these animals share, which may seem like a trivial point, but it was a pretty big deal back uh, in the Cambrian, was they have, they have, everybody has a mouth, has a gut that goes all the way through, stomach and other stuff like that, and then a, 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 a hole at the other end. Right? The idea of having a gut that goes all the way through is something that's shared by all of these animals, no matter how diverse they are. Therefore, that was already present in that bilaterally symmetric animal. In fact, almost all of these animals have a left and a right, which is more or less the same, and a belly and a back, which is different, and then an axis that runs from the mouth side to the other side, where there's a, a brain and other sort of sensory organs. Right? The sensory organs of flies and us might seem different, but they have, they're organized in the same way in the body plan. And so presumably, this ancestor already was some kind of a worm that had that body plan. So that's great. We can go back 
550 or so million years. And then I want to know what's the ancestor of all living animals? It's going back as far as I can within animals. And that's this purple node here. And now I have to bring in the animals that don't have that body plan of a, a mouth and a tube. These are the cnidarians, so that's sea anemones and jellyfish. Periphera, which are sponges in their various kinds of forms. Tenophores, which I'll talk about later, they're kind of superficially like jellyfish, but they're very different kind. And then placozo, which I'll mostly ignore. But these are other animals that, in most cases, they have openings, which function as mouths, but they don't have a gut that goes all the way through. And they don't have a brain in the same way that we think about all of these animals having a brain. They have, some of them have a nervous system, but we don't know what that was. And I've drawn this in a way where we don't know how they branch. So this ancestor is a little bit of a mystery because I don't know how to incorporate these animals in with these animals because they're so different. And I can't really, I can't even recognize a mouth in some of them. So how am I going to compare? How am I going to do that same kind of fine scale thing that I was describing with the, with the, um, with the bones of the arm? And then, if I look at living animals, I run out of room. There are no other animals that are alive today that are not in this, uh, in this, uh, in this group. The, uh, the next organisms that I have, the next kinds of life, are different sorts of amoeba that are not animals. They're not multicellular. They don't make sperm and egg. They don't do the kind of things that is the minimum requirement to be an animal. So I want to look really deep back in time and try to understand something about this. Because I know if I were there, if I could you know, go back in some kind of submersible and just watch, and I had that patience to look over hundreds of millions of years, eventually I would, I would go back f too far and I would say, well, there's nothing here that looks like an animal. And then stuff would happen. And eventually I would reach this point, and among all the living creatures that were alive at that time, one of them would be the ancestor, one species, would be the ancestor of all future living animals. Could I, could I recognize that? I'm, I'm not even sure. Because there were lots of other evolutionary experiments going on at the same time. They just didn't survive. These are the only surviving other lineages. So that's a little sort of almost philosophy. So if I want to look back that far back in time, I have a problem, right? Because I can't really compare bodies in a, in a, in a sensible way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use DNA sequence. I'm going to use genomic sequence, genetic information, to try to see how far back I can push this logic. So I don't have access to this kind of information. I'm going to have to use some other information. I guess we're going to ask, answer questions later. But if anybody has something that's not making sense, please just flag me down. All right, so 30-second introduction to genetics. So this is a cartoon of the chromosomes of a typical uh, female human where each individual will have two copies of chromosome one. This is a long DNA sequence. It's a single molecule. They're not found in this form. Typically, these have been artfully arranged by a cytologist who's looking carefully at the chromosomes. But you see you've got two of each kind of chromosome. The reason you have two is one comes from your mother and one, one comes from your father, right? So that's this essential paredness of the sequence. And then each of these chromosomes, then you're going to pass on to your, your progeny. But you have two, you get to pass on one to any individual descendant, right? So you get two from your parents, you pass on one, the other one comes from your, your partner, and it keeps going. So these pieces of DNA, which are represented by strings of uh, genetic letters, they have these 20,000 genes in them that make up the human genome, the set of all genes, um, can be traced back one generation to your parents, two generations to your, great, to your grandparents, three generations to your great-great-grandparents. And there's kind of no reason to stop at that point. We don't have family records for what our families were like thousands of generations ago. Right? But a 1,000 generations is like 20,000 years. So that's the beginnings of civilization. Right? But I know that these chromosomes, they've been passed on every generation in that same way. 
I don't have to stop at a thousand generations. I can keep going back because I know that this works in all animals. So eventually I go back 10 million years and now I'm at a point where humans don't exist. The human lineage has not arisen yet. The chimpanzee lineage has not arisen yet. I have some kind of ancestor of humans and chimpanzees. But those chromosomes from 10 million years ago, pass them forward, 10 million years, they get to us. So I can go forward in time or I can go backward in time and I know that there's this unity that allows me to relate the sequences to each other, the genes to each other. So as long as I can track the genes between different organisms, I can figure out something about ancient genes. And I mean ancient, like really ancient. I don't mean like ancient like Neanderthals. I mean ancient like the earliest animals. So this is something that we've discovered over the last, I guess the, we sort of had the first inkling of it about 15 or 20 years ago, but now it's, it's really very clear. Each one of these rows here represents a different species. A sea scallop, amphioxus, sponge, jellyfish, hydra. Hydra is freshwater, but these other ones are all marine creatures. So I think I've fulfilled my, my duty here. Um, so, and, and each of these black lines represents a chromosome. And then you can't see it, but these are sort of fine threads that run vertically through the picture. And each thread is a single gene. And I can say there's a gene in scallop, which is the same gene as a gene in this kind of marine worm, amphioxus, sponge, jellyfish, and hydra. And I can follow them and the way they're grouped together on a chromosome in all of these creatures. So now I'm looking very broadly, right? Hydra and, and sponge and jellyfish, these were at the far right of that big picture. These are the non-bilaterally symmetric animals. But I can see, you can sort of manifestly visible here, this periwinkle group of, uh, of genes has stayed together. They're on a single chromosome in scallop, a single chromosome in amphioxus, a single in sponge, a single in jellyfish, and a single in hydra. This is a group of genes that have been traveling together in the same way that the bones of my arm have been, in a sense, traveling together. So I can use this to infer something about the ancestor. I can say, I don't know a lot about the ancestor, but I know that it had a chromosome that had these periwinkle colored genes on them. That's the nature of the kind of mental gymnastics that we're doing. Of course, each one of these genes has a function. It contributes to the way the organism works the way the organism develops, responds to disease. So in principle, I could start to look at those features too. But right now, I'm looking at this very big picture view. And if you stare at this, you'll see a couple of other patterns. There's the pure conservation. Then there's streams being crossed and mixing. And there's streams coming together and then separating. And so this is chromosomes joining together and joining together and mixing. And I'm sort of contractually obligated as a, as a you know, geneticist to talk about this very briefly. But these are the kinds of processes that allow chromosomes to change. So I said, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Chimpanzees have 24 pairs of chromosomes. How, does that, how do the chromosome numbers change if they're being passed on from generation to generation? Every once in a while, chromosomes join or split or something happens to them. And we have to be able to track that if we want to go back far in time. Okay, so here's my, I'm going to use these ideas now to tell you three stories, if I have time. The first one is, what were the earliest animals like? What was the common ancestor of all living animals? Those are two subtly different questions, right? Because the last common ancestor of all living animals was the one that's going to diverge into living groups. There could have been other proto-animals that we would have recognized them as animals, but they're not the last the most recent common ancestor. They're not the, the last one. So here are the candidates. Here are the lineages. Am I, am I not? I should be right on top. OK. Um, these are the different lineages that have survived today that are sort of candidates for the oldest lineages of animals. There's the sponges. They're benthic. That is, they live on the sea floor. They're filter feeders. You can't see it for, at this scale, but these branches, if I were to zoom in, I would see a lot of small pores. 
and water is constantly streaming through those pores and coming out through other pores, and in the process trapping bacteria and other food that then the sponge eats and goes into it, it's, allows it to grow. There are the cnidarians, the jellyfish. The living cnidarians are all carnivorous. That's what the stinging does, right? It allows them to kill other animals with nervous systems. They have this gelatinous form. These are sort of harder, the basis of like a body sponge. They live both benthically, sea anemones, and also pelagically, floating around as jellyfish. And they have a nervous system. Sponges don't have a nervous system. You can't find neurons or any, any recognizable feature that you would say, aha, that's like a, a nerve. There are comb jellies, which are another kind of jelly-like organism, but a very different lineage. They're also carnivorous. They're also planktonic. They also have a nervous system, but they really don't look the same. This is, the jellyfish is kind of a almost circularly symmetric thing, right? The bell of a jellyfish. These are formed as two lobes. Jellyfish swim by pulsing. These guys swim by flickering a row of little hairs that they have, or eight rows of hairs. So these are very different solutions to living in the water, water column. Placozoa, I won't really mention, they're really microscopic. They were only discovered a few, uh, less than 150 years ago. Um, and if to, this is blown up. You, to see it, you'd have to look under a microscope. And at first you would say, oh, somebody sneezed on the microscope, I need to clean it. And then you would realize that no, these little pieces of snot-like things are crawling around in their animals. They also don't have a nervous system, they're very small. And then you have the bilaterally symmetric animals, mollusks, arthropods, all of the other animals, the ones that have a gut that goes all the way through. And I lump them together in, on this scale as bilaterians, bilaterally symmetric, left, right, about the same. And we know a lot about these kind of animals. Anybody know who this is? Proud son of San Francisco. Cal, class of, I forget. This is Rube Goldberg, <laughs> who I, I think of as kind of the patron saint of, of evolution, because, because things just have to work, right? They don't have to be elegant. So I look at these, and, and if I try to use their body morphology, it's really hard for me to figure out how this, how this, how this branching occurs. I show it just as a, as a split. So what we've done using these chromosome fusions and, and breakage is made progress and figured out how this, uh, how this works. And we've resolved this from all, all five lineages have an equal chance of being the earliest to comb jellies branched off first, or the lineage leading to comb jellies, and then the lineage leading to sponges. And then these animals are more closely related to each other than they are to sponges and, and comb jellies. So even though comb jellies look superficially like uh, jellyfish, they're really from very different groups. Now there's another sort of contractual obligation, I have to say, as, a, as an evolutionary biologist. These are the living organisms we see today. Don't confuse them with the earliest members of their lineage. Right? This is a lineage that led to this, but it was presumably, at those earliest times, a very primitive version of itself. Okay. Now look and see there's something interesting here. These organisms have a nervous system, but sponges don't. And previously people had said, well, sponges don't have a nervous system. They must be the earliest branch. They must have branched off before nervous systems were invented. But if you believe this tree, which I think we, we, we do, this implies that nervous systems must have been lost in sponges, and also lost in these small, hairy, flat animals. So we are forced to, to conclude that even though nervous systems, you know, we would not want to lose our nervous systems today, but at the time, these nervous systems were dispensable in these lineages, maybe because they were small, maybe because they were not going to move around anyway. They were going to stay more or less in one place. They didn't need it. But these are sort of retro backstories that I'm trying to lay on there. What we do know is that there is a nervous system in this branch, and then there's an, another nervous system that arises here. And I can think of it as a very primitive nervous system that arose early, was present in this ancestor. And then it was so primitive that it was not a problem 
to lose it in these other lineages. So I think that's kind of a cool, the, the other alternative would be that this didn't have a nervous system and nervous systems were invented here and independently here, which could also have happened, but I think it takes a little bit more special pleading given that some of the same neurotransmitters are used. We have to in convergently evolve that. Okay, second story. We're eventually gonna get here. These are the vertebrates, these are us. If you look in this picture, you'll see that echinoderms, which is the fancy name for sea stars and sea urchins and sea cucumbers, they are in this group, this red, orangish group, that is more closely related to us than all of these other you know, earthworms or octopus or flies or other kind of worms. But I know that echinoderms look very different from us. So how did it come to be that they look so different? Right, they're sort of an exception to this rule that these animals have a gut that goes all the way through and a left and right that is mostly symmetric. If I look at a, at a, a sea star, it, the main thing that I see is this five-fold symmetry, the five arms that come out. They do have a mouth and they do have a, a tube that runs through and a, a, a hole at the other end, but it's, their body plan is organized very differently. So if I'm gonna understand all, these, all this evolution, I should have some way of thinking about how that body plan changed. So here's a kind of a zoomed in uh, version of this. There are a lot of different kinds of echinoderms. There's the sea stars. There's the crinoids, which are a deep sea uh, variety. There are the brittle stars, the sea cucumbers, and then the echinoids, the sea urchins. And all of these have, at some point, you can identify this five-fold symmetry. Their closest relatives are an otherwise nondescript group of worms called acorn worms. And this group together is the closest group to vertebrates and other, a few other groups that I'm leaving out here just for simplicity. This has a worm-like gut structure that is clearly, to an evolutionary biologist, related to the gut-like structure. I, 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 when I put up the Commodore's picture, I didn't mean to imply in any way that he was sort of, a, you know, to be compared with these, with these uh, simpler uh, creatures, but this affinity is much clearer than this affinity. And so another long story cut a little bit short just to give you a, a sense of the flavor of what's going on. If I look at early development of us and all vertebrates and even those acorn worms, they have a recognizable head and they have a recognizable tail. And there are specific genes that are expressed in the head, the back of the head, the neck-ish region, the trunk, and then the tail. And these genes are expressed in that same way, not just in us and acorn worms, but in lots of other animals, in all the animals that are bilaterally symmetric. So this is kind of a marker for the ancestral structures that, that are found along this body axis. So now I can ask, I, I see these genes, the same genes in uh, sea stars, I can ask where, where are those genes expressed? And if I look at the, the dark blue gene, that is in some sense what evolution has done to the territory that is the most head, head most part, and so forth. And when you look, this is to make a long story short, a very talented Postdoc Laurent Formery working with Chris Lowe at, uh, at Hopkins uh, Marine Station down in Monterey um, did a lot of work to show that if I look at the underside of a sea star, that's where its mouth is. And all of this head-like structures are all splayed out on the underside of the sea star. So the underside of a sea star is in a sense like the head of the sea star. And then if I look for the trunk, I don't find it. So this has been described as, it's, what this work shows is a sea star is like a disembodied head walking about the seafloor on its lips. <laughs> so you can, you can remember that phrase. Uh, yeah. So evolution has this ability, of course, to change things radically. But even though this change happened 500 some odd million years ago, we can still sort of puzzle it out by looking at comparing the living animals today.
So that I think is kind of cool and it's gonna affect how we think about the process of evolution and the way we look at fossils. There's a lot of very weird echinoderm fossils that we can now try to interpret in this way. Even though we don't, can't get genes from those fossils, we can think about it. How am I doing on time? Okay, five minutes, perfect. Okay, so the last thing that I wanna sort of summarize for you is to think about how we got from this wormy ancestor up to this wormy ancestor. These are the acorn worms that I showed you. These are the um, sea, sea stars. I wanna get now to us. I wanna think about how we came from this earliest animal to the bilaterally symmetric worm to the worm that gave rise to this group to us. So the suspense is, you can cut it like a knife. Okay. So, so this is just a summary, zooming in on the part that we care about here. There's the sea stars, acorn worms, and now I'm breaking up vertebrates into a little bit more detail. I have animals like the hagfish and the lamprey, more marine uh, vertebrates, which are very old lineages. There are hagfishes and lampreys have been around for over 400 million years. Um, in the oceans, and they don't have jaws. If you look at the, at the mouth of a hagfish, it's got a sort of an opening. The mouth of a lamprey has this kind of rasping sort of, sort of structure. These vertebrates don't have jaws, but they have other features that look vertebrate-like. And then I have jawed vertebrates, the ones with bones, and the ones without, the cartilaginous fish. I'm showing here a, a, a skate. Okay. So I'm interested in knowing what happened here when these organisms were evolving. <clears throat> so the first thing I should do, <clears throat> excuse me, is look at the fossil record, right? Because now I'm talking about developing hard parts. So that's the kind of stuff that leaves a fossil record. And this is a complicated sort of a picture, but what's shown here on the, on the horizontal, on the, on the up and down axis is, the, um, is time. This is 540 million years, the Cambrian. And each of these black lines is a place where fossils have been discovered and tracked back to different, line, li, different living lineages. And then there's these dashed lines here. The dashed lines, we have no direct fossil evidence, but by comparing the body plans here to each other, there's a sort of a, an inference about how this happened, ultimately giving rise to these living groups. But the reason that there's all this, these dashed lines here is that in this region of time, maybe 50 or 60 million years, for reasons we don't fully understand, <clears throat> there are basically no fossils. Or what fossils there are <clears throat> are little tooth-like structures, right? Maybe that fell off of some body armor or something. So I don't really know what the animals looked like. I just know little bits and pieces of them. So this is perfectly suited for our, the kind of challenge we want to take on, I want to try to figure out what happened a long time ago by comparing these living animals and, and try to make some guess at what might have happened in this uh, gappy region. Okay. Oski is not a living, well, he's a mascot. <laughs> Inside Oski, though, I'm told there is a living human. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so I, I've left out vertebrates so far, and now I have to deal with one thing about vertebrates, which is kind of interesting and, and should make us feel good about ourselves, <clears throat> which is if I look at those genes that are, that are expressed along the head, from the head to tail axis, the ones that I used, or some of the ones that I used for the, um, to think about sea, sea stars, I find that each of these different colors represents a different one of those genes. And if I look at most invertebrates, sea urchins, the acorn worms, other worms, flies, other more worms, I see that they have typically one copy of each of the different colors. But if I look at us, so tetrapods, four-limbed animals, that's us, I find not just one copy of the, of the red gene, but I find three copies. And if I look at all of these genes together, I see that there must have been a quadruplication. So we have, in some sense, four times as many um, 
at, at the start, we had four times as many genes. A lot of them you can see even here for these important genes, a lot of them have been lost. So we don't actually have four times as many genes as invertebrates. But there was a process of quadruplication that gave us more genes at the start, and some of them we've taken advantage of. This is the idea of this uh, Korean, Japanese, American uh, biologist and, and mystic, <laughs> Sumo Ono, who came up with this idea that this was an important feature of, of, um, of evolution, that by somehow making two copies of a gene or three or four copies of a gene, now those genes could do subtly different things and could, that could lead to increased complexity. So I'm not gonna talk about how that works. I'm just gonna use this fourfoldness as something that I have to understand. I'm gonna sink my teeth into and try to figure out how that might have worked. So I've kind of glossed over the technology of genomics. Um, as, as Ron said, I worked at the Human Genome Project 20 years ago, and we've been sort of riding the wave of all of the new developments in technology that have made sequencing organisms cheaper and cheaper and easier and easier. In the, back in the day, we, had, we needed to have a whole series of factories to sequence the human genome. Now a single lab using technologies that came out of that um, can do any kind of organism they want. So while previously you had to say, we're gonna put together a big effort to sequence the mouse genome because it's gonna be important for biomedical research. Now if I have enough little, you know, small bits of money, relatively small bits of money, and the will to do it, I can go to the ocean and pick an animal out of the ocean and sequence its genome if that, that's gonna help me answer a question. So we've been doing that, looking at specific kind of, the, the, sea, or the, the sea star is an example of this. Here's a, a, a sort of like an x-ray picture of a skate, which is a cartilaginous fish like sharks, but it has these massively expanded pectoral fins that it uses to kind of swim along the, along the ocean, the same as, along the bottom of the ocean, the same as rays. So we're interested in this animal to understand how those pectoral fins evolved. But we also, in the process, got the chromosomes. So these are the different chromosomes. Lur is the scientific name for this uh, little skate. And these are the 40 largest chromosomes, one to 40. And they're colored in a way that means something to me. It means nothing to you yet. I could make it mean something to you if I had a couple of hours. Um, these colors represent the ancestral chromosomes of the earliest um, of our kind of animal. And what you can see here without a lot of, uh, uh, it's not that hard to see, is that there's a lot, each, each color is present in multiple copies. So this A1 color, this particular blue, is present in two copies here and there's another uh, copy here. This purple is present here, 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 and here. So there's four different copies, three or four copies of every one of these colors. That's the manifestation of that quadruplication. The other thing that you can, that you can see if you stare at this um, long enough is that you see certain combinations in common. This light green and this yellow, this light green and this yellow, that's the same combination. So when mixtures occur, when two colors appear on the same chromosome, it often happens twice. Here's another example, this pale blue and brown, and this pale blue and brown. There's one large copy and one small copy. These kinds of patterns, if you stare at them long enough and do enough little mathematical, statistical analysis, tell you about how the chromosomes went through this quadruplication event. How you went from having an invertebrate-like set to emerging on the other side to a vertebrate-like set. And this, even though this is a cartilaginous fish, our chromosomes have the same kind of pattern. All jawed vertebrates have the same kind of pattern. So this is the point at which you should have goosebumps, but I'm not sure I've done a good enough job of inducing the goosebumps. I still get residual goosebumps. We, we can now, by looking at, we've done a lot of this kind of work, There's a, it's, it's a hard thing to summarize. If I look at hagfishes, lampreys, cartilaginous fish like sharks and skates, bony vertebrates, including you know, most of the fish you eat, but also amphibians and birds and us, I can make this 
understanding of how vertebrates evolved. We started with a typical invertebrate set. There was a doubling. Now there are two lines coming up. That means there's essentially two copies of every chromosome. Then there was a divergence into this group and this group, and then more doublings happened. One of the consequences of there being one large and one small copy of the mixtures is that that implies that one of the, the second duplication here must have been uh, hybridization. So normally we think you can't hybridize two different species, right? Yeah, you can make a tiger mate with a lion in captivity, and you can do it both ways. You have a liger and a, tr 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 what do they call it, a uh, tigon, right? <laughs> but, but those are not, that's not the founding of a new lineage, right? They're, they work as animals, but they're not reproductively successful in general. That's our, our experience today, and that's our experience with animals we're familiar with. If you think about fish, you can find examples where in the relatively recent past, there has been this kind of interspecific mating that gave rise to a new species. Goldfish are an example. And so this process is happening in certain lineages that maybe we're less familiar with. And what we know now is that in that gap region I showed you in those 50 million years, somewhere there, there was an interspecific hybridization. And that interspecific hybridization gave rise to all living jawed vertebrates, including us. So we're the result of, I'm, I'm trying to get this phrase to catch on, I don't know if it's gonna catch on, promiscuity in the Paleozoic. That's my, that's my tagline. And I think, uh, I think Rube Goldberg would have approved. Okay, so that's, the, that's what I was hoping to, to show you, uh, some kind of an overview of the diversity of animals that are alive today and how we can use these ideas to work our way back and under, to understand ancestors and then work our way forward to understand evolutionary change. And um, I'm going to end with this quote, which I really like from Ted Chang, the great science fiction writer. The past has left its traces on the world we only, know, only have to know how to read them. If you go through, this is a great museum in, uh, in Paris, right by the, 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 the main gardens. This is where they brought all of the skeletons that they obtained from the voyages of uh, discovery, exploitation, however you want to think about that. Um, and they just crammed them together in this one uh, space. As you walk through this, you see the remarkable similarity of the structure of the skeletons and you're immediately struck by the fact that they're related to each other. And I can think about what that must tell us about the past. And what I hope I've shown you is that the looking at DNA, even in this very pictorial kind of sense, gives us a way of going even further back in time and answering some of these complicated questions. So let me end by thanking the people who did a lot of the work. Oleg Simakov and Ferdy Marlitaz, they're now professors uh, in, in Europe and they led a lot of this, this sea. Um, the sea. The Tinafor work, the earliest animals, was led by Darren Schultz in close collaboration with Steve Haddock um, at the Monterey Bay uh, Aquarium Research Institute. If you haven't had him, you should have him. He's a great speaker. You have. Um, uh, Nick Putnam, who was uh, working in the, this kind of, he was the first one to recognize that you could see these uh, chromosomal threads, and then many other people. So I'm happy to take questions, looking forward to it, and thank you for your attention. Great. <clears throat> Great, Dan. So let's see. Sharks are 400 million years old. We're um, a couple million years old. Are sharks evolving more slowly now are we evolving more slowly? You know, I think, I think there is a sense in which there are some animals, like horseshoe crabs and sharks, where the modern uh, individuals resemble more closely the fossils. So in that sense, they're slowly evolving. Um, I think we, you know, we see all the change that's in our lineage. We're interested in ourselves. So that, I think, heightens our awareness of the the changes that we see in our lineage. So those two things are happening together. So some of us think that use of tools is what allowed humans to you know, ascend the top of the animal kingdom. So we're using tools now at rates that some animals don't use tools. Is use of tools changing the rate at which humans are evolving? 
and how? Probably. So this is all speculation. But I would say because we have the ability to use tools like, you know, glasses are tools, right? Right. So I'm pretty myopic. I probably would not have done very well in the, you know, 10,000 years ago. So my genes wouldn't have done well. So we're, we're allowing some genes to propagate that we that didn't weren't propagating earlier, and that has that has some benefits, right? More more diversity that gets through. It's also in some ways conditioning the way our our gene pool is changing. So, so I mentioned earlier the sharks you said are 400 million years old. Are they evolving very slowly now because they've been perfected, or would they be evolving differently if their environment changes? So the what causes the rate of, of evolution? That's the yeah. Core it's question. a really it's a really interesting and important question. If you look at that geological stack that I showed at the beginning, there are a few places where there were mass extinctions, right? And so the extinction of the dinosaurs. There's an even bigger one that happened 250 million years ago, where a group of animals called the trilobites were were were, uh, were became yeah. extinct. And so it's thought that these one school of thought is that these big major changes due to changes in the environment are what knock out some organisms which had been successful under the past conditions, now they're no longer successful, and allows other animals to take their place and to diversify into new habitats, new, new approaches. So it's a combination of, the, the rate of evolution is a combination of something that's intrinsic, but also something that is responding to changes in the environment and which animals are better able to do that, to, to respond in that way. Now, I'm going to keep asking questions because our speaker is so fascinating. And uh, if you have a question, hold your hand up. Kathy will bring the mic to you. And when we have online questions, Kathy will read those to us all and we'll get to hear them. And our speaker can answer them. Kathy. Hi. Hi. So, yes, I have a question from online. So, based um, on you know, your description of life, would we even necessarily recognize life, quote, quote, on a different planet? Yeah. On a different planet. Would we recognize life on a different planet? Online question. Yeah, that's what we were, Fritz and I were talking about this before, uh, be, before, the, before the talk. As, as Fritz was saying, there's a, there's a group at NASA that's c come together to try to answer this question. Mm -hmm. If it's life that resembles us in its biochemistry, then that's relatively easy for us to do, right? If, if you find something that has never previously had contact with Earth life, that has DNA in it, well, that's, that is a pretty good marker for our kind of life. What's harder is the potential that life has evolved in other places using different kinds of chemistry, different kinds of molecules. And how do you recognize those? Some of those molecules that are part of our makeup are very unlikely to happen uh, by chance mixing of stuff, right? They require some kind of organized biochemistry to make them. And so I think the kind of things people are looking for are these very unusual kind of molecules that are sort of stereotyped, right? That you don't just have a whole, you know, tarry mess of different kinds of molecules, but the same kind of molecule over and over again. Probably the only way that can be made is by, is by life. We have a question from the audience, Fritz Maytag. Actually, I've got two questions, a quick one and a longer one. I bet Cro they're both uh, long, but... Cro chromosome. Uh, yes. Chroma in Greek is color. That's right. Well, what's the etymology of chromosome? Yeah, that's a great question. So chromosomes are, as you're, say, as you're noticing, they're, they're, that word derives from colored bodies. And so early, I think, in the 1800s, the late 1800s, with the evolution of the chemical industry in, in Germany, people were using new kinds of chemicals and ask, asking, do they stain cells in different uh. ways? And these were staining bodies that were recognized with particular kind of, kind of treatments. And so that name has stuck, even though the coloredness of them is not an intrinsic biological feature. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, the second question, you mentioned uh, Japanese. Was he a Japanese-American? Oh, no. Oh, no, Korean, uh, I think Korean-Japanese <clears throat> ancestry. You glossed. It sounded intriguing. You, you quickly covered his theory. Would you... Delineate, uh, explain it a little more. Yeah, so he was, so, so it's only pretty recently, like in the 50s, I think, that we even knew that humans had 46 chromosomes, 23 pairs. 
So that, the, and the discovery of the chromosome and the, the sort of analysis of, of chromosome number really only started like in the 1910s. So there's been a big body of, of knowledge and what Ono noticed was that if you looked within the vertebrates, he could see patterns that seemed to indicate that genomes were getting bigger and there were more chromosomes. You have to look at it just right to see the patterns because he, had, he didn't have the kind of information we had. He was looking at these very coarse pieces of information. So he would, uh, the story goes, he would, you know, it, a, a chromosome set would be published as a picture in a, in, a, in a journal. He would print that on cardboard, cut out the chromosomes and weigh them to try to get a sense of how much material was in there. In his analysis, he postulated a series of genome doublings that he said maybe this is what gave rise to vertebrate complexity. And so he, I, I call them a mystic because a lot of it you have to sort of look at it just right and have that creative uh, spirit. Um, and, but it's only very recently, like in the last, I mean, I, I would say within the last 15 years, that people have really understood how that process worked and, and where in evolution it happened. And some of that work we just published in the last year or two. So it's, it's an evolution of an old idea. But yeah, it's a fascinating a historical question. So globally, are animals losing diversity? I'm not an expert in this, but that's what, that's what I understand. That there is a, there is a reduction in, in diversity, increase in extinction rates over the recent past. Are plants reducing adversity? I think that is also true, yes. So given that evolution is this adaptive process yep. in the survival of the fittest, et cetera, um, would short lifespans um, lead to faster evolutionary uh, modifications or faster evolution? So there's, there's lifespan, which is one, one contributing factor. Another factor that you might not think about is how big are the populations? So if I have a big population, there's more chance for mutations to happen across the whole population and more chances for a beneficial mutation that counters whatever the environmental change is. So that's one, one aspect. Another aspect is how subdivided populations become. So there's a, there's a, I don't think there's a really simple answer to your question, but yes, given enough time, we expect that there could be adaptation. You know, if you have to live at higher temperatures, we know that there are changes that could do that. Are they going to arise fast enough is the question. So in, in modern dystopian views of the future, you know, Blade Runner and, and visions where uh, post-apocalyptic Earth continues to ev evolve animals, um, it, you know, get to the important part. How about cockroaches? <laughs> are they going to keep evolving and stay ahead of us? Cockroaches are not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, John uh, tells me we have another oh, online. Oh, although, yeah. I, so the, the, the ancient cockroaches were the trilobites. Okay. The trilobites were everywhere, and there were thousands of species of them, and they preserve really well. Mm -hmm. um, probably people, anybody who collects fossils has, has mm -hmm. seen them. Um, and they just went extinct 250 million years ago. Really? A big catastrophic change. And after that, you just do not see them in the fossil record. They're not, their lineage just died out even though they were probably the most common animal at the time. So it, it, I, don't, I don't think we're guaranteed that cockroaches are going to last. I don't know exactly what, what is going to be the, the bullet that's going to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. um, so this adaptive characteristic um, that allows for a species to survive, um, you're saying that has to do with, you know, first the size of the population, so you get a higher likelihood of mutation, and then you get uh, short generations, I don't want to put those words in your mouth. Short generations, which means you get more and more and more a, a changed replication of the species and so on. Yeah, okay. so short generations are usually associated with large populations. Okay. So if I have, you know, you know rapid generation time, please, I, get, I can get a lot of them very quickly. So that okay. certainly also 
uh, also contributes. So they can yeah. adapt more rapidly changes in the I think the that's generally true, yeah. Okay. We have another question online. Kathy Trafton, Vice Chairman of our committee. Kathy. Hi. I'm actually in person. Yes. I thought you had <laughs> It's my question. question. I know you thought yeah. that. Um, so I have a question just following up on what you've been saying about um, losing diversity, losing populations entirely, partly because of the segmentation of their um, areas, you know, just partly because of a small, um, maybe because of human decimation, you know, very few individuals left in a species. So there are human efforts to try and um, stave off disaster. So people are seed saving, they're trying to preserve genes from certain animals. Yeah. Um, they're making underpasses underneath Highway 17 so that the mountain lions and other um, fauna can you know, wander underneath and keep the gene pool robust. A, is this really gonna make a difference? Is this really gonna help when you see the enormity of, you know, of geologic time? Mm -hmm. um, and is it ethical to bring back species that have become extinct? That's an easy one. Yeah. <laughs> well, is it which way is easy? Which way? Don't leave me hanging. What, what, what's what's so easy about it? <laughs> I was I was being <laughs> kidding. <laughs> I mean, so is it is it ethical to bring back species? Is it ethical to bring back species? Was it ethical to make them? I mean, there are some species where it's pretty clear that it was humans that drove them to extinction. Um, that the ethics of that probably weren't debated yeah. when it was happening. Right. Um, is it ethical to bring them back? I, I think you know it becomes a very interesting set of questions. It has to do with you know do you that, how much do you value the animal, the welfare of the animals, right? To bring mm -hmm. back an animal mm -hmm. that doesn't have any of its other kind, mm -hmm. what, what what does that do for that mm -hmm. animal? But these are these are sort of um, non scientific questions. I think they're they're beyond scientific questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, how and, and, sorry, and then the question of you know are the are the Efforts that we're making to sort of preserve diversity, do they, do they matter? Um, you know, there's a big effort to preserve the diversity of uh, certain large wild cats. Steve O'Brien and his group have been doing that. Mm -hmm. And I think they're, you know, they're holding, they're holding the line. They're, they're maintaining the diversity of those, of those populations. It, the the timescales that I was looking at of hundreds of millions of years, it's really hard to know you know, something that happened over the course of, you know, a few decades, did it have an effect 100 million years later? I'm sure that that has happened evolutionarily. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, I can't I don't know how to predict whether what we're doing now is going to have that kind of long-term effect. So now looking at bones, looking at dinosaur bones is one kind of fossil record, but yep. what about fungi? And what about, uh, what about mosses? And what about real small creatures like that, which might be able to evolve and rapidly change. How do you, can you track their fossil record or their ancestry? Well, you can certainly track their DNA in the way okay. that we've, we've talked about. So, so that's the way you you're know, gonna do If that. I okay. were a fungal biologist, I could give an equivalent talk about fungal diversity and how we can work our way backwards. We've done a lot of work with plants and tried to understand that. Each group has its own different sort of set of evolutionary things that it does well. Plants do this genome duplication that I talked about for vertebrates. They do all that a lot, and that seems to have been important for plants. John, do you have a question from online question? Yes. I have a question here asking, with the reduction in the cost of genome sequencing, does it follow Moore's law? Will it continue and expand? <laughs> So, so the question is, with the reduction in cost of genome sequencing, will it follow as rapid a change as Moore's law and get less and less and less expensive? So would there be public use of such tools? Right. So it, it, it certainly has, since the time of the Human Genome Project 20 years ago, it cost $3 billion to sequence the human genome. You can do a pretty good job of sequencing the human genome now for a few thousand dollars, a comparable, comparably good job. So I think you've seen that. And if you look at the plot, it follows that. Moore's law kind of um, having every some number of uh, months. Is it going to continue to get cheaper and cheaper? Um, probably we're going to have some sort of plateau because they're for, for a bunch of reasons. But I think once you get to the price point where it a thousand dollar genome was a goal for a long time, now it can be done for five hundred dollars for biomedical purposes. That is, I think, a sweet spot for people being able to use that information medically. And at that point, I don't know if it's going to get much cheaper. The Human Genome Project, such an incredibly, uh, you know, incredible team. How big was the team? How big was your part of it? What was your part of it? So we had at, uh, so the 
the major players in the Human Genome Project were the National Institutes of Health, the Department of Energy, and the Wellcome Trust, and then also funders uh, around the world, uh, in Germany and Japan. Um, and they were, they set up several major centers. There were five or six major centers. And one of them was run by the Department of Energy in Walnut Creek. And that's the facility that I was associated with. We had, I think in its heyday, almost 200 people there. Mm -hmm. So now we've seen people who are talking about uh, uh, solutions to the climate issues. And some people are talking about evolving uh, uh, animals, plants that live in the ocean that we can grow that will eat oil. And um, what can you talk about using, um, you know, your tools in evolution to evolve special species that serve human needs like this? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, the, the, the specific idea of having bacteria that will eat plastic waste or will yes. eat, uh, bacteria do a lot of things already. <laughs> and so it's, I think it's not even a question of evolving them, but it's a question of recognizing where those kind of capabilities are already present. And, and that would be the fastest thing, rather than evolving something new, finding bacteria that are already attacking plastic and maybe giving them the right environment to do it. So I think that's a very profitable line of, of thinking. So what countries are contributing most to this research, to genomic research? Oh, it's pretty international. Um, I think the, the, the U.S., Japan, Germany, there's a center in Norway, I, I'm, the U.K., I'm, I'm hesitant to try to list some because I'm going to leave out okay. some places where my, my friends and colleagues are working. But I think it's a pretty international group. What forces are supporting your work? Who supports your, this kind of work? Yeah, so my, my work is supported by the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub in, okay. in San Francisco, uh, a little bit from the NIH and the NSF. Um, I have an affiliation with uh, a university in Japan. Uh, in Okinawa, which okay. is a real center for marine diversity. Um, so those are the kinds of uh, sources of, of funding. Describe your team now and the disciplines within it. Yeah, so we have, I, I talked about Laurent's work with the Sea Star. Mm -hmm. He is a really talented embryologist and comparative biologist who's trained himself in genetics and genomics. Chris Lowe, also at Stanford, the same way. Um, the people I have in my own lab at Berkeley Many of them are, are trained in quantitative sciences and are experts in working with DNA sequences and, and this area called bioinformatics, where you're doing a lot of computer computational analysis. My son-in-law so is a bioinformaticist at, at Stanford. Cool. Scientist, yeah. yeah. yeah Amazing. So, he has hundreds of millions of files, and he's tracing um, the efficacy of certain drugs and the yep. uh, predilection for certain diseases and so on. Right. Yep. So I think that the sort of people that are at the bench, people that have experience with, with animal diversity out in the wild, and then people that are at the computer working together. I think that's the, that's the, that's the secret mix, the, the magic mix. So in the same way that uh, animals, bugs, etc., might be evolving given the changes in the environment or the climate, what is happening with evolution of human brains? How are they evolving? How are they evolving now? How are the human <laughs> brains evolving? <laughs> um, you know, the, the, the changes that are happening now are happening so slowly that it's almost impossible to say what's going on. The kind of things that you can see that are changing in human evolution mm -hmm. almost all have to do with the response to disease. Response to disease, okay. Yeah, so you can see, if you look at, <clears throat> if you look at the, 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 the way the genomes are changing in humans and the way they're but looking, say, comparing against ancient DNA uh, from thousands of years ago, what you see, the genes that are most, most of the genes that are changing have to do with response to, to disease. And so we're constantly fighting that battle, and that's the, in the short term, that's where evolution is, is paying off for us. So is intelligence, what we call intelligence, is that evolving? It's certainly evolved. Mm -hmm. Is it evolving now? Mm hmm uh, maybe, maybe that gets into too much politics to talk about. <laughs> okay, well, to say serious, as some people in the yachting world know, I recently crossed over from being a lifelong sailor to buying a powerboat, i.e. crossed over to the dark side. And so an important and serious question is, given that all yachtsmen... Is that are, more intelligent or less intelligent? Good question. That's a, that's a question. Very good question. Um, 
given that all yachtsmen you've shown are related to worms, is there any evidence that power boaters are more worm-like than sailors? I would have to do a bunch of genomic analysis to figure that one out. Great. <laughs> Dan Roach here. It's so great to bring your expertise Thanks and insights lot, to the Wizzy Yachting Lynch. And thank you so much. It's been Our a pleasure. pleasure to have you. Thank you. <laughs> Good job. Terrific. 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 How fun. How fun. How fun. How really, really fun. <laughs> I'm happy to stick around as long as uh, you have questions or whatever. This has been a presentation of the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon.